Oh, hi, Daniel. Thanks for thanks for joining us this evening. No problem. We're just going to wait for people to come in the room and just make sure that we're actually on. Uh, but it's great to kind of chat because obviously we've spoken, we've connected kind of off air. We, we've had a little chat before. And um, oh, there you go. We're definitely in now. And everybody's there. People are coming in. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hi. Uh, let's just um, oh, let's just get rid of that. Uh, good. Yes, people can make. Yeah. So we, we've connected. Um, uh, oh, somebody's trying to spam us already. So you can go out the way. Uh, uh, remove comment fan author. Right, there you go. Sorry, Daniel, that's what happens sometimes. Uh, yeah, good. Um, hi, welcome everybody. Quite a few people in the room. Welcome, Daniel. Um, I just had to get rid of that one thing. Don't click on any links you see in the place. Uh, oh, that's gone, they've gone. Hi, Debbie, hi, Maya, hi, Shay, hi, Nikki. People are coming in, that's great. Good to see you, hi, Jody. Yes, yeah, so we've spoken a little bit about already, uh, Dan, obviously off air, uh, Daniel off air, and um, uh, I just love what you're doing with your with your business. So uh, Animal Behaviour Kent, uh, and you're doing a lot of stuff. And I really got attracted to your work because of your kind of focus on, on trauma and neuroscience. And also, I think it was interesting because you're quite new to the industry. So there's quite a lot there for us to unpack tonight. So welcome, Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a certified uh, behaviorist with the IABC. Uh, you run Animal Behaviour Kent. Um, you're doing your ma have you started your master's now? Yes, yeah. yeah, I'm doing my master's in neuroscience at the moment. And how is that? Do, do, does it feel very different? Because I have to tell you, when I uh, I started my master's, I had this conversation with Robert Robert Taylor actually. So I did my degree. This is back be way before you even could do online stuff. So you'd have to physically mm. turn up or not. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, you know, I, I didn't really get my head around it, so I didn't, I didn't, uh, I did about six months of it. Daniel, that was yeah. as far as my master's career went. How do, you, how are you finding it? Yeah, really good. Um, so far, so good. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's really interesting to see, um, to, to take in information, um, from one point of view in terms of presenting. Because my master's in neuroscience, so in terms of general neuroscience and fundamental neuroscience knowledge and think about how that applies to my industry, which is obviously working with pets um, and um, what that may be able to do in terms of informing us of interventions, future things that might be relevant to dogs. I mean, I think this is that's kind of the the perspective that I take when doing any education, whether it's dog related or not dog related, is, is, is kind of how does that apply or how might this apply or not apply uh, to working with animals? And that's really important, isn't it? We, we kind of dived in a little bit here, but, but I want to just have a little listen to your own kind of um, origin story to mow down. But, mm. but what, what, on that point, though, I think what's really important for us is that uh, this is why I like looking at things through the kind of emotional experience, lived experience lens, because it's all very, um, it's all very unique for us as individuals. And, and this is where, of course, science struggles a little bit. And uh, I use that Candace Perk quote quite a lot because she says that science doesn't like to look at the things that can't be measured. Uh, oh, there's somebody else in there all spamming us. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to get rid of these things. Uh, don't click on any links you see in the group. I'm going to try and do it as I go. Uh, um, but she says that, you know, science, what science can't measure, it sees as the non-things, but for the individual, those non-things are everything. And I think what's important is learning as much as we can to get as many threads as we can to start thinking about how much we can help learn more about that individual and uh, this is what we're talking about off air about how especially when we think about trauma about how uh, how individual it can be as well as the things that we know more generally and especially and especially when we think about neuroscience um there's still so much we don't know about okay we know that this might fire up or this might connect to that but we still don't know about what that next knock on line might be in that chain you know which we can unpack we'll unpack some of this stuff yes so, definitely uh, lots to talk about daniel so let's just take a little bit because i think what's interesting for me being a an old gentleman uh is uh you're somebody who a lot of us you know we've kind of muddled our way through the community as it's evolved because it's gone through quite rapid evolution in the last 10 years you know but here you are a younger younger gentleman who's uh you know you decided that you, what you wanted to do and you had a very clear path then didn't you, you had a very clear vision about what you wanted to do regarding education coming into the industry 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I was actually going to do my degree in English before um, I started uh, taking an interest in dogs. So completely different um, end of the spectrum, kind of more the artsy route. Um, but um, then I ended up after having actually, as, as you can probably guess with most people, right, after having some issues with my own dog, saw a behaviourist who I still actually work with to this day. She's actually now part of my business, which is really, really cool. We're actually... Um, work together now um ended up doing a degree in psychology um and training in animal behavior um i also became a dog walker which gave me experience just kind of just generally working with dogs as well um so yeah anyway then completed my degree in psychology and, and again like with the neuroscience going through that sort of always thinking about how does this apply to dogs um one thing the psychology aspect of my education is really um that, that really interests me is is, is the human side um, of working with with dog caregivers as well. Um, how we might influence behaviour because one thing that's I think very apparent to me is you know there's so many people in this industry that um, like to perhaps shoot people down on Facebook or kind of have that kind of very sort of um, quite combative tone with people sort of tell people that they know best and all those sorts of things. But actually, from a behaviour change perspective that tends to be really, really unsuccessful. So, you know, something we have to do in our industry is both think about how we change dog behavior, but also think about how we change human behavior. Um, so I think that's something that's really interested me um, in, in, in my career. Um, sorry, I've forgotten your question now. Anyway, no, I you answered that really well. No, I was, yeah, no, I was asking about how you kind of came into things. I think that's, um, so we've got, we've got quite similar routes uh, in as far as we go got the human psychology thing first. And of course, you know, back in the day, we used to, you know, there's a lot of people in the industry who, who was working with dogs and so they didn't like people, but that's not really fit for purpose anymore. And especially when we move away from more of a task oriented kind of training model only, we have to engage. And, uh, you know, I, I gave a talk recently on emotional safety and how important that is. And, and we have to bring the client in on that, of course. You know, how often do we say to the client, OK, this is what we're looking to do. This is our next kind of plan moving forward. Do you feel comfortable with that? Are you invested in that? Is there any challenges for you with that? And I think definitely this thing about changing behavior, we, we have to kind of support that shift in awareness, don't we, about what those care and support needs might be. And we've got a, quite a challenge against some way because there's so much misrepresentation of dogs out there and there's very few safe spaces for people to be vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um Unfortunately, the, the the challenge with behavior changes is, is in, in humans, particularly, is it's really slow. So people don't tend to jump from one sort of extreme to the other. Usually it's a, a sort of staged progress uh, process. So getting people to do that, like you say, you need to be there to help them and provide that support network to, to do that, which can be really challenging. Um, it can also, the, the the issue is that I think we don't think about a lot is, is, is that's a lot of emotional investment for us, potentially, if we're not careful and putting ourselves in potentially a, a, a bit of a challenging situation, it can be uh, quite emotionally exhausting. Um, but we need to provide some sort of safe, supportive network for people to express what they're what they are struggling with and help them make changes that are going to be supportive for them, for their dog, and is hopefully going to enhance the relationship between them and their dog, which is what I love kind of what I suppose this whole group is about in terms of that dog centered care. So um, in, in caring for that dog in, in, in a way that hopefully enhances the relationship for both parties as well. Um, yeah, and I think that's important because this kind of brings us neatly into trauma a little bit because uh, I think what's worth saying actually just on the human psychology side of things that when, when I did my degree in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, that's a long time ago, um, but uh, there were just as many different camps and persuasions and kind of views about you know is it this that triggers this and when they would they would say that is the thing if you change that then you will change this but actually as we move on that kind of more progressive side of looking at these things especially the progressive side of um uh childhood educational psychology and development that what we see now we recognize that it's greater than the sum of its parts quite often and, and this is the thing about trauma and i think rewrites our story like trauma um and how we continue Re being re-traumatized through not feeling safe and not being able to communicate need and not being able to hear those that need 
be put back. And, and a lot of the time, I'm sure you find the same, Daniel, and other people listening, that when we start talking in the kind of more emotional realm terms, how many people really start to associate with what their dogs might be going through because they've been through similar things themselves. But that creates an extra level of duty of care on us because we have to be aware of that. We can't just leave them hanging. <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, you, you, empathizing is, I think, like you say, it's a, it's such a important thing to be able to do, and it, it can be so valuable if you can empathize with what your dog and what your dog's thinking and what they might be going through. I mean, we're never going to know a hundred percent what they're going through, but you can, you can still make a really good go of trying to understand what they might be thinking, what might be going on for them in a particular scenario. Um, but then that that could come with a cost for, for for you as a dog owner or a dog caregiver. Um, so yeah, being being careful there and providing the support there, and I think that's where it comes down to as well. Also knowing what your role is as as a behaviorist and being able to hopefully signpost an owner to appropriate um, appropriate support if if actually if that brings something up for them. Um, I've been lucky enough that that has only happened to me a handful of times when <laughs> I'd say actually even less than a handful probably less than five times um, in a consultation where that seems to really working with the dog seems to really brought something up for um, the dog's caregiver. Um, But it's really, really important to be able to know, know firstly that that is a risk of working with dogs. That's a risk of any sort of, any sort of family counseling scenario, whether you're working with a family of just humans or a family with dogs. And hopefully also just having that kind of, um, support um ready from both you as the practitioner but also if you kind of need to reach out for kind of further support because this is a bit above kind of what you're dealing with or what we're dealing with as behaviorists having kind of that cuts that signpost network of you know things like um different different counseling organizations and things like that that's important isn't it because i I know i'm very lucky locally but um you know i know two of the local social worker teams Uh, i've got a friend who's a who's a psychotherapist um I've got another friend who's, who works in, in uh, uh, childhood, child safeguarding and protection. Mm. And these, you know, um, the wonderful Mayor Rose, who's in the group tonight, hi Mayor, uh, who, who specializes in, in, in this kind of field, talks a lot about how important these kind of networks are for us. And, um, and I think that's important, but I think most people, many of my clients, and I'm sure they say uh, others will relate, when they start on this journey, and if, if we're doing it well, and we're slowing things down, and we're just trying to kind of get the kind of information that we need and we're trying to join the bits of the jigsaw together for that animal's needs. The, the caregiver, the human, can't help but learn from that themselves, actually. And, it, and it's quite a profound process for many, I think, because um, and especially when they realise that the, the, what they are often told, especially by a lot of the TV shows about what their relationship should be with their dog, which doesn't feel right for many people, but they're actually allowed to connect on a deeper level, uh, it brings out all sorts of extra uh, aspects. Yeah, and, and I think that's really cool because one thing that's well known in the education field is is things like lectures and just kind of that kind of face on teaching where you just sit sit back and just tell someone stuff is is it works okay as a way of educating people but it's not the most effective way to educate people so if you can work with people and say hey we've got your dog here and we've got they're having some sort of issues you're having probably some issues as well because this isn't obviously isn't an ideal situation for you potentially as well um how can we figure this out together how can we work something out that's going to improve your relationship with your dog improve their life hopefully have the knock-on effect of improving your life and that may not even be something as such as a big change to their life but just having a bit more empathy for their dog and knowing that their dog's not not being you know just a general pain in the arse and actually is having issues um that might be related to fear might be related to some sort of anxiety might be related to um something completely different as well um trying to think of other issues now but nothing comes to mind but you know might be related to something beyond them generally just being a sort of adversary or something to their owner because there's a lots of as you say lots of perceptions around why dogs are behaving as they are especially from tv shows and stuff when they're saying oh your dog's just being insolent or your dog's just being this or that mm-hmm. and i think that's really important and i love what you said there a minute ago because um there is a big difference a huge difference between what we're taught and what we learn and actually the stuff that we really fundamental learn, that's that kind of experiential learning stuff that we think, oh my God, that has value to me. That's resonated with me. That's the stuff that we really take on. Um, and I, I find that t- talking to caregivers with the right kind of language, talking in terms of safety, relief, 
you know, um, you know, uh, regulation, all these kind of terms that are very relevant for us as well. And like I say, we don't know how dogs think and feel, but but we don't know how each other thinks and feels really. You know, I don't know how I can't. I can't say I know how you think it feels. Only the, the only emotional experience I can validate is my own, of course. And but I think, um, especially the word relief, because many caregivers, that's why they want us in, right? Because they want relief mm -hmm. themselves, and their dogs are looking for it. So this is important. So uh, trauma. This is something that you're really interested in. I, I know, and a lot of your posts, a lot of the things you put out there, and especially looking at what this looks at from um, from a. Uh, kind of neuroscience and neurobiology point of view. Uh, let's just start off with kind of an outline of trauma then for you. Uh, and um, because it, it's become a bit of a, it's very much the word of the month at the moment, I think, and a lot of people talk about trauma. But, but I think there's a lot of misrepresentation of trauma, in my opinion, from what I see. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's such a big topic, isn't it? And you're, I think I, I completely agree with this. Misrepresentation, misrepresentation of trauma um and it's obviously it's a very generic term isn't it is it's kind of just really meaning any sort of big psychological or physiological insult so we can go from having some sort of big injury we could even talk about something like you know a, a, a veterinary issue a dog um being hit by a car or something like that or we could be talking about something like um emotional abuse um, that a dog might have experienced in the past. It could even be things like being taken away from their mum too young. So that's a massively broad spectrum. And the potential impacts of that are going to be really, really broad as well. Um, so that's why I'm really interested in this from a neurobiological perspective, because it seems unlikely to me that, that we would see exactly the same response in in those two scenarios and i think that's what that's what the data has that does support is that there's a very as a broad spectrum of different responses to trauma and we see that in terms of the neurobiology of patients that have experienced trauma and also the observable behaviors of patients that have experienced trauma to some it can come out in um very very fearful behavior for some it can come out in what we're classifying the dog world i don't love it as a term but abnormal repetitive behaviors things like that you know chewing their tail self-mutilation behaviors that's a completely different presentation of um trauma and actually that's talking about a broad spectrum of traumas we could talk about dogs that have the same issue that have the exactly the same trauma and then that presents in a completely different way behaviorally as well so it's i mean it's it's such a broad spectrum of things to think about um there and also thinking about why why might a dog why could two dogs have the same experience and one of them could experience post-traumatic stress and things that come alongside that and one of them could kind of just sort of it could just sort of um yeah wash over them and it could mm -hmm. be not actually a big issue um so there's a lot to think about isn't that and that is a really important point because there is one thing which is quite subjective of, as part of this uh kind of um, thought about trauma and one which is more objective so <clears throat> you could have what others might see as a traumatic experience but the individual may not be traumatized by it mm. uh, you might have a situation where some um, so others might not perceive it to be a traumatic experience but the individual is very traumatized by it and this is why it, why it gets complicated we, we can't just say this is this this is that black and white a, you know one plus two equals three and even science struggles with that, don't they? You know, doesn't it? I, I was uh, sharing a stage with Robert Faulkner Taylor, who uh, uh, talks a lot about these things. And he, we were talking from a kind of pharmaceutical point of view, even from a big pharma point of view, how difficult it is for them to formulate stuff that has a chance of being able to have a positive impact on neurochemistry when 100 people could take it and it might only have an impact on a certain small number of that. And the other people it doesn't have a, a, an impact on now, six months it might because it's because it's just so complicated isn't it i think from that. yeah and then unfortunately the economics of that means it's even more of an issue so say you do have that successful drug that treats one in a hundred trauma patients that would be fantastic still for those one in a hundred trauma patients right but mm. it's probably never going to come to market because um that would make no money for the for the company that produces it so that's the the other sort of sad issue um that we have in in the in the whole kind of arena um but I mean, yeah, definitely a, a, a lot of variation in the neurobiology as well does mean that it having a drug that is a one size fits all for trauma is really, really tricky. So we'll come to the neurochemistry, neuro neurobiology in a minute, because that, that, you know, 
we only have the chance in these chats to touch the surface but already I think we're having quite a profound conversation about some of this stuff because it's important to talk about some of these things and I think for me especially having a trauma-informed approach and again I hear that said a lot and I think there's different people have a different view of what that might be uh we have to when we I always presume trauma and uh, Daniel uh, you know I've got a vet colleague who always presumes pain I think it's a good place to start um uh uh, only because I think we can, you know, uh, we've all experienced trauma of some sort. Uh, but when we think about the uh, the animals, talking about dogs specifically, who are who have uh, had those traumas and who may well be traumatized, it's a really good example of where some of the maybe more arbitrary approaches to behavior change that we might use more operantly, for example aren't necessarily fit for purpose for animal because just because the animal does something different doesn't even mean they feel different and, and the wonderful Rachel Leather who is a trauma specialist uh, sexualized trauma mainly in the human world who's now come and giving amazing education for us in the in the dog world she says you can't train safety you can't teach it you have to feel it you have to feel safe and uh, and I think that's an important consideration for us when we're looking at eking forwards with a dog who's struggling to be able to process things without being without being overwhelmed yeah yeah and i think it's it's a hard fact i think for some people to contend with is is that if you know say obviously i haven't been lucky enough to have not been attacked but if say i was suddenly someone in my household just attacked me and you know physically caused me a lot of damage i'm probably not going to trust that person again however much training or or um behavior sort of interventions that, that i'm given you know i could speak to the best counselor best therapist in the world but it, it's going to be really really hard if someone makes a if someone physically harms you like that um in in such a way then then it, it can be really really hard to overcome those things and unlearn those things our brains aren't designed in a way that um means we can unlearn those things very very easily at all um we have no mechanism for unlearning for example we have just a mechanism for for new learning which kind of comes in and says to that past learning it, it doesn't it's not so relevant anymore you don't need to activate here if you know what i mean um so yeah getting that feeling of safety really you need a bit of a blank slate to a certain extent in my in my view or uh, to, to to kind of come away from some of those past triggers maybe readdressing them later in life if that's something you want to do but but really setting up some sort of new context new environment where a dog can feel safe so i suppose what i'm thinking of is of a dog that's been abused by a previous owner um it's going to be really really hard for that dog to have a successful happy safe life with that owner um and especially if we're already pre if we are already um pre-designing and pre-evaluating what we think safety means to that animal mm. without recognizing oh wow do you know what? I, I'm, I'm working with a, a dog at the moment which has just started to come it, it became a very traumatized state stayed pretty well exclusively in the dining room kitchen is now coming into the lounge it's not having any tactile contact with the caregivers but the fact that it's changed that space to come into that space with them for me is a big thing for them um and the big uh the big um challenge for them is not to make a big thing of it now because that because we've got to keep the brain but another point there is i think when dogs uh who have been in a traumatized state and then start feeling safer guess what, they start communicating that. But often they'll communicate that in ways that we can, if we're not careful, see that as problematic behavior. So again, another client of mine, the dog has now started barking when the postman comes and started barking at the neighbor. Those are great things for me for this dog because it, it shows a shift in that dog to feel safe to communicate. Um, and I think quite often when dogs do go through that stage of being able to feel safer, because they're learning that they can actually remember this is a big difference between what they're taught and what they learn they have to learn that intense in, intrinsically it has to be an innate feeling of thinking about i can do this how often do we then jump on those behaviors because we know everything oh, no, we can't you can't do that that's not right um uh, so this is why we have to re this is a truly a true trauma-informed approach for me which is very much letting us learn from the animal little step by little step about what it is that they might show us that shows that they're starting to feel a bit more connected or a bit more safe but as you say to, if we're looking at that end thing of oh yeah that must look like you will come to me for hugs and cuddles 
that may never be the case for some dogs. They may never be able to do that, but they might be able to come and share space with you. Mm. Yeah, and I think yeah, realistic goals um, are really really important there, and and just I think having enough sort of um, having the communication skills with the animals, and 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 also sort of having enough respect for the animal that if they're like actually do you know what I'm not a cuddly dog anymore, or I'm not a cuddly dog these days, or I'm just not generally a cuddly dog because of experiences I've had elsewhere, that's fine. Um, yeah, and just and just sort of respecting that and 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 going with kind of what they're comfortable with i mean we've got plenty of people in the world that don't love having hugs and yeah. most of us that's not not true to say all of us but most of us are good at respecting that if people don't like having hugs <laughs> but it's amazing you know because um i think about my husband and i i like to sit down and i just like to watch the world go by if we go to a party or an event he's on the dance floor already right feather bow he's off but um a number of times people around me are like what's the matter you know come on why are you being miserable and i'm like well, actually i'm really happy well i was until you started putting that pressure on me because you per- you're perceiving me enjoying this in the way that you feel that i should enjoy it and i think this is the same i, I see some stuff uh, by some people who really are into the connective side of therapy that somehow the answer is always to be connected physically that we need that hug, that we need that tactile hug. But trauma kind of goes against that a lot of the time. And it's, it's not what we want. And sometimes we just want to share social space. You know, being socially connected, safe social connection, isn't always about physical connection. It's just thinking, I feel safe that I can sit here and that Daniel will just let me be quiet. For example, you know, that's that says a lot, doesn't it? Especially when working with dogs, I think. Yeah, I think this is why everyone should have um, have a cat, in my view. <laughs> because, um, yes, because cats, <laughs> if they're upset, I, I learned this as a child because I actually grew up with cats, not dogs. Um, so I learned this as a child, the not the best way, really, but never mind. Um, if my cats were upset, I could go to that, but like, oh, hey, it's okay, cat. Um, Clarence, who was his name, um, and right he now. would. Oh, scratch me <laughs> and I'm like okay <laughs> he doesn't like that but you know if you sit if I sat down in the room to him he'd kind of purr at me he'd kind of engage with me thinking about cats as you kind of like oh hey what are you doing they'll kind of look at you might blink at you a little bit so you learn quite quickly that actually they do like social engagement but if they're upset they probably won't want to stroke most majority of cats so it's a, a good kind of learning experience working with another animal like that because often dogs that have experienced trauma uh, might be uh, might do the same in the sense they, they maybe want that social companion they want that 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 physical proximity where they may be in the same room but they might not want to actually cuddle you um i know um if anyone saw the trauma in dogs conference this year um kathy murphy did a really interesting talk about this 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 effect of allodynia um where yes. sensitivity mm. to touch can potentially increase as a result of trauma so that mm. might be something that, that those animals are saying which might mean they want their social needs met in a different way um to maybe the typical sort of happy-go-lucky dog that just loves cuddling and touching you in every single way <laughs> That is a quote of the, the talk so far for me. Social needs met in a different way. I love that. And it's really profound, actually. And, I, and again, um, you know, just going back to my husband, he's a, he's, he's what's in life lover. He was a dementia nurse before. Mm. And, and working in a dementia home, you really have to learn about how you provide the social needs in a different way. Uh, and this is why... This is truly actually the essence of a true dog centered care approach. It's thinking about learning and getting feedback from that dog first. And actually there's a great saying, which is um, uh, many a a path to coercion is laid with good intention. Because, you know, we might think I know what's best for my dog. And if my dog does this, they'll feel okay. And all that kind of stuff. But it might be the last thing they want. And talking about cats, I was at a client the other day and I got attacked by their cat. <laughs> I, went, I dared to do it, try to stroke it. Uh, and the client said to me, uh, her exact words pretty well were, um, oh, he likes to share space with you, but just don't touch him. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, and I'm sure some of our listeners could relate. They're happy to bit share space with people. Just don't touch me. So. Yeah. So that's important. I think trauma has that because these are extra parts of the story. And when we start to, I use my doors, the brain analogy and, you know, the brain having doors in, in there and we need as many doors open to have a chance at doing that kind of processing well. Trauma is, is a big door closer and, and you can't force those doors open, Daniel. You have to pr- try and provide the environments 
to allow those those things to happen. So this is a good opportunity to connect this to the neurobiology, I think. And this is something you wanted to add on that, Daniel. No, no, no. Go, go on. <laughs> yeah, no, I think because because this is um there's a lot of stuff that connects us all, actually, and, and um especially us and dogs, actually, you know, uh, on, on a on a kind of a physiological, biological level. But there are some things that go on that are very unique to us as an individual as well about how these things connect and that kind of thing. But go through some of the um, uh, some of the kind of encoding side of things around trauma because I think that's quite an interesting area. Uh, I saw a post you did on that recently. That might be a good place for us to start. That initial thing that happens. So we have the potentially what might be classed as a traumatic experience. What then is more likely to create an internal environment that makes that traumatic? Yeah, I mean, so there's there's all sorts of responses that you get during any sort of stressor. So whether it's a traumatizing event or not, um, but uh, the the kind of the two key axes that, that that might be looked at are the SAM axis. That's the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis, during which you're kind of having adrenaline fired and noradrenaline fired, and that happens during that very acute stress response. That kind of kicks off straight away. So, for example, if um, if in the middle of the night I hear my front door kind of slam shut, I mean, crap, um, or a window break, I'm probably kind of start getting adrenalized pretty instantly. Um, equally, if that stress then goes on, so then I hear someone rustling through my my drawers or something like that, I don't know. Um, then after a few minutes, that's when you get the next axis starting to kick in, which is your HPA axis. So that's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that starts firing out glucocorticoids, which includes cortisol and corticosterone. Um, cortisol is the big one that's out there that, that's kind of flying around in mammals. Now, what's really interesting about those two axes is they're they're not working in isolation. So they start working together. So um, noradrenaline alongside um, something that, that's involved in the HPA axis called corticotrophin releasing hormone, often called CRH. It doesn't matter too much what it's called, but noradrenaline alongside that. So a bit of the HPA axis, a bit of the SAM axis can interact to help encode trauma related memories. Um, and then one of the things that's known about kind of fear related memory, trauma related memories is they're not often very detailed. Um, if, if anyone's experienced something tra traumatic, uh, you know, sometimes there's the odd detail that sticks out, but it's not a clear sort of representation of the event. So if, if we think about perhaps a dog that's had a very traumatic incident down the park or something like that, they might just remember they went to the park. It was awful. This dog came up to them <laughs> and, you know, not remember details such as, oh, I went to the park. It was an evening. Um uh, this German shepherd that smelled like this came up to me or this poodle that smelled like this came up to me. Not I don't want to pick on any breeds, um, but um, came up to me and bit me. Um, they're probably not going to remember the details of this is what it smelled like. This is what this dog looked like. It's much more likely they're just going to remember they went to the park, some dog came along, it was a big dog and it bit them and it was horrible. Um, and just focus on that because actually that's going to serve you much more well um, from kind of an evolutionary perspective than remembering the exact details. Um, because if you just say, actually, you know, I'm going to avoid all dogs now, um, then you're much more likely to survive. You're much more likely to prevent that instant happening again. So it, we can kind of see that on a neurobiological level, but also on um, a uh, on sort of an evolutionary level as well interesting because um when you look at some of the kind of research done around things like somatic system and somatic memory and th there was one that was done with um uh, racing car drivers and then what they were measuring when they went on things like um roller coaster rides and that kind of thing uh but also um they're being less likely to be traumatized traumatized by a car accident than you or I who isn't used to feeling different aspects of it. So, and I think this is why, why in that moment, if you imagine a kind of um, a relatively blank slate e dog who hasn't really had negative experiences, but then has a really horrendous one, as opposed to that dog who's had lots of little ones and then has a, a kind of relatively big one, you can already see how that might be interpreted differently by the brain and what it might attach to. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, 
it's, it's interesting how many dogs might might really discriminate after a traumatized event and other ones will generalize mm. you know this yeah. whole environment does not feel safe to me now not just the fact that it's the dogs in it or whichever way around and and this is what's so interesting about how different everything is so uh okay that's a really good introduction then about the, some of those things that happen in the moment what are we looking at then regarding what bits of that neurochemistry become invested in that event yeah so i mean the 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 first thing that you see changing really is that that long-term potentiation process so that's kind of what's called ltp it's often taking place in the hippocampus um it can take place in other regions of the brain as well it can take place in the amygdala which is often where it pops up in terms of remembering fear related memories um often in terms of reward related memories as well there can be connections to another area called the nucleus accumbens which helps remember rewards so it's involved in all sorts of um memory formation and essentially what it's doing is the, it, it, when cells fire together they they can if, if a strong enough message is sent so whether the cells are repeat if we've got kind of a, a presynaptic cell so a cell sending a message whether that's repeatedly fired or just fired once at a very very high degree if there's a lots of neurotransmitter being sent out there's lots of that kind of memory chemical which is called glutamate involved in forming those memories being sent out to the next cell that can cause the next cell to change it can cause the next cell to be ready to hear that message again in future um mm. so it can cause more receptors to be produced on that that post synaptic cell, so that cell that it's sending the message to, which means that next time when even a little bit of glutamate comes along, that post synaptic cell is like, oh crap, this thing's happening again, um, which is again very adaptive. It's great um, if you're living in that kind of um, evolutionary environment where you may be just being chased by a potential danger once a month or something very rare, but in a in an environment where for example, if we're thinking of dogs learning about humans or learning about other dogs, where they're going to be seeing both of those things a lot, it can be a real problem. Um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of what's happening in terms of the memory encoding. But then we've also got to think about how that might change the neurophysiology of the dog more broadly. Um, in, and, and that is where things get really complicated, in my view, because that's where you can see a lot of varied changes depending on the type of trauma. So trauma does literally rewrite the brain. It's not just a flippant thing. It, it literally does change how that brain will take on new information. It puts it through a different filter, I guess. And and uh, um, uh, and, I, and I guess when we think about the the kind of notion that perception, the perception of what's around us is everything, is how we perceive it, whether or not it's real or not, it's our perception of it. This becomes really more challenging then, doesn't it? Because if that if those neural pathways have, have really been created and that brain has been restructured, the risk there is that information or stuff that's going on in the environment that isn't a threat, the, the, that is perceiving it to be. So it starts to become maladaptive then, doesn't it? And yeah. I guess the whole thing of trauma, isn't it? It's a case of a whole system seeing threat when it isn't necessarily there yeah yeah and you know it's i think that's the thing isn't it? it's maladaptive in the sense of in the here and now but the here and now is very recent isn't it in terms of how populations are built up how dogs have come in to start living with us so expecting their brain to have kind of caught up with that on an evolutionary level and not encode memories like that is really really hard um and yeah and the other thing is yeah, there's there's those differences in in how that trauma encodes so i mean one thing that comes that comes up a lot is 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 cortisol and glucocorticoids so those that stress steroid that often gets released by the hpa axis um the way the le levels of glucocorticoids can be altered by trauma um and it's not in the way I would have expected because I would have said, OK, probably the, the, the stress hormones, so probably they're going to increase as a result of trauma. Now, that does happen in some trauma patients, but equally in some. Um, so, for example, a common one in humans is war veterans. There's actually decreased glucocorticoid um, production. So actually the levels mm. go down, cortisol levels go down. Um, and that's a really, really interesting effect because one in potential impact of cortisol is it can actually it, it can repress intrusive thoughts 
So actually cortisol decreasing um, may actually cause the rise in intrusive thoughts in um, in people that have experienced trauma at, in, in this case after um, going to war, but it could be in all sorts of scenarios. My suspicion is it's very, very long term, long term trauma, sort of longer, longer lasting traumas might have this mm. kind of reducing effect on cortisol. Um, but I think that's an interesting one as well, because that's something you can measure quite easily. And that's actually we could actually measure dogs that have experienced trauma, said you've, you've had this traumatic event. How has this affected your cortisol levels? And if so, they do have lower than average cortisols compared to to sort of typical neurotypical dogs, mm. um, then that might indicate that they're actually having intrusive thoughts, which is something which, again, dogs are never going to tell us. But if they are experiencing that, that's really rough for them, because we know as humans that well, humans that do experience PTSD, that's quite a rough experience. So that kind of phenomenon, then, would, would that kind of tie into this notion that some people who are traumatized can experience really heightened emotional responses and other people have that kind of emotional numbing. It's like a dampening down where they don't actually feel, they find it hard to feel anything. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely I wouldn't go as far as to guess how that may be related because I'm not sure. There may be some research in terms of how that's related and, and kind of what different um, different sort of neurobiology, neurobiological correlations may explain that. But I think definitely it is related to some extent. And, and that kind of emotional numbing um, is a big, big problem for many patients that have experienced um, traumatic, traumatic events. Um, one thing that, again, trauma can influence one, one neurotransmitter is something called GABA. Um, and GABA is often thought of as this anxiolytic hormone, anti-anxiety um, neurotransmitter, not hormone, sorry, um, because it is what gets targeted by benzodiazepines. So when you're giving your dog, if, well, if you're giving your dog, no, it's not a standard thing, um, but if you're giving your dog, you know, a, a Xanax or a Valium, um, then that's going to be increasing their GABA transmission. Now, that it can be great in some cases that can reduce the dog's anxiety. It might be able to help with the treatment of some behavioral issues. It might be able to help with things like going to the vets. So that's all great. But um, what that's really doing, what that really is, GABA, is, is, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it, it has the effect of inhibiting the um, amygdala, um, which is kind of the, the big the big function in that anti-anxiety treatment. But we also don't necessarily know what else it's inhibiting. So um, with benzodiazepines, it seems to be slightly more specific. It seems to have have generally quite quite good effects in terms of with with most patients, particularly on um, early treatment. It tends to just pretty well treat the anxiety. But Trauma, traumatic events, again, can cause variable changes to GABA transmission long term. So, again, the impact of that is, is, is unknown. For some dogs, it's reported that or some humans, sorry, this isn't actually research from dogs, but for some humans, it's reported that they have increased GABA levels. Some humans, it's reported, reported that they have decreased GABA levels as, as a result of trauma. So, you know, increased GABA levels may actually correlate to emotional numbness because it's actually inhibiting some of the circuitry that's allowing them to experience some of that, emo that those positive emotions. But it's just hard to know. I mean, it is, again, unfortunately, that, that stage of neuroscience understanding and research only gives us so much of an insight into what's going on. And in the last 10 years, a lot of what we saw as being perceived wisdoms around neuroscience is now being turned on its head again. Uh, and um, as I say, I had the privilege of spending time with Robert Fulton Taylor. Rob, uh, Rob, Robert's going to come in and do another talk for us in the group. Uh, but, um, you know, he was sharing a, a, at the London Vet Show a, a talk on uh, looking at the GABA specifically, actually, and, and how you have the, the kind of... Um, almost cigar shape around it and the different types of receptors that things can attach to. But if you look at one little bit of the brain circuitry, which is all he does, it's one little bit, that could have a million, literally a million different outcomes. And that's why it's just so hard, you know, uh, to kind of, um, to work out some of these, these connective elements. But I think it's really interesting that something like trauma, you know, this notion of having a traumatic experience, and I think the kind of more general definition of trauma is, 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 um, is um, an event which, which causes the nervous system to be overwhelmed. That's kind of a very kind of basic thing. But 
but how we can all be kind of experiencing so, so very differently. And, uh, and that's where it gets really interesting and extremely complicated because with humans, at least we can verbally communicate. Although having been involved in human therapy myself, we're pretty naff at communicating emotional need and uh, things, but, but, um, but even more so for the dog and especially a dog who isn't doing much. You know, we can do our observations and we can even if you're very minded in, I want this behavior to increase or this behavior to decrease, that's great. But it's a bit more tricky when there's no behavior at all, hardly. You know, there's not much going on. Uh, and it's convincing those around these dogs, I think, Daniel, that, that we don't have to do very much, that actually less is probably the best thing to kind of see where that animal might be seeking some safe anchors. Hmm. Yeah, and I think what I would, what jumps out to me on that is from the neurobiological perspective is both is the time it takes to take a new to change your neurobiology and that the trauma firstly can change your neurobiology but it also you, you can do things to start changing it back and supporting it um but there's there's usually a lot of time there and i think it's very interesting what you were chatting about with 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 robert uh, um, and kind of the effects of those specific systems and specific circuitry that might influence various different things um we can both think about kind of how how a circuit may influence other areas of the brain but we can also think about how firing of a circuit may influence the the cells that it's firing to directly and how how messages might actually not just go to the next cell but go into a cell and go into the nucleus of the cell and actually start changing the transcription of our genes. So changing how our genes are read and how they're um, understood and what they, what they, what's produced from them in the rest of the body as a result of um, traumatic experiences. So, I mean, to give you a very practical example of that, um, there's a really cool study um, done on chicks. Well, actually, it's not a very cool study. I shouldn't describe it like that because it was a bit uncool what they did to the chicks. But uh, <laughs> um, so basically, the, the chicks weren't exposed to proper parental input and what that led to was a decrease in um, a promoter gene called a bdnf promoter gene being activated so this gene that that promotes a peptide in the brain so again another brain chemical called bdnf wasn't promoted as well um wasn't transcribed as well um due to maternal deprivation and this actually put chicks at higher risk of experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, yeah. or, um, so, I mean, it's, it's or, or in, the, in the case of these chicks, it wasn't actually called post-traumatic stress disorder, but it was a higher risk of kind of being stress sensitive and, and, and very sensitive to stressors in the environment. So also kind of the way cells interact with each other is really, really important um, in terms of kind of what they cause, um, what they cause in terms of the, the, the genetic aspect and how they cause genes to be read and promoted and translated into practical brain changes as well. And uh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen some of those studies and, and uh, it's been done on, on different uh, species, actually, I think, and, you know, over the decades, so similar things. And uh, when we think about how heavily invested the brain is to seek safety, especially safe social connections for us social mammals, um, how much we're doing, whether it's children, but we're talking dogs specifically, uh, how much that brain needs to know that regardless of the ebb and flow of the stresses of life, that it can find a safe connection to kind of retreat to and how we're not providing that neurology to kind of combat that, because that's kind of what's implied by those studies. Obviously, those studies are quite an extreme version, which is no connection. But even when we think about a lot of the crap advice that's still going on about letting puppies cry out and putting such a huge emphasis on purely obedience and compliance when the dog is in that developmental 12 months and how often they're actually trying to express need through behavior, which is arbitrarily shut down because we've decided it's not right. We see the same with kids. I look at the, the joke, we've got a TV show over here called Super Nanny. <laughs> yeah. And I look at some of those kids, you know, and you think to yourself, how many of those kids are undiagnosed neurodivergent? How many of those kids have experienced trauma? Actually, they're going through a secondary trauma now because they can't feel safe to communicate need while they're in a dysregulated state. It's interesting, Daniel, I think. Yeah. Um, 
it's it gets more all this stuff I find fascinating, Daniel. I think you're an amazing you 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 just you kind of share this stuff really well, but I'm sure others in the room may may feel it's also kind of quite overwhelming <laughs> because yeah. we, we think god it's really hard actually behavior is really hard it's, it's it's in the old days we turn up with our little toolkit whether it was positive or punitive but we've got to be way more nuanced than that haven't we we've got to really slow down and let that animal tell us as much as we can learn from them i think without yeah, judgment I, or labeling yeah no I, I i completely agree and i think it can be so overwhelming i mean <laughs> like whenever i think about it i'm like oh god yeah. <laughs> how do we even how do we even start a case how do we even think about dealing with some of these things um it's it is so so hard and i think that's where yeah uh, the effects of interventions aren't necessarily reliable so if i go in with a clicker in a tree and i say hey we're gonna take this dog up to this thing that we're scared of that they're scared of not we're scared of um that they're scared of when we're gonna click we're gonna treat we're gonna click we're gonna treat the effects on an animal's neurobiology is who knows <laughs> who knows what it's going to do it might further sensitize them to what they're scared of if we're not careful it might lead to no real change it might lead to them learning something completely different like that tree over there equals a treat for them so i mean you know we don't know but what you can be fairly um predictive of is if you do if you are able to provide safety um for an animal then the neurobiological changes that you see are tend to be pretty consistent they tend to be pretty reliable in the sense that we start to see or you start to see the brain recovering um you start to see the brain becoming stronger you start to see those synaptic connections becoming stronger so for example one thing about increasing serotonin or there's a big kind of misnomer about serotonin that that uh, depression anxiety is caused from decreased serotonin well it's, it's not the only da data for that really is from the drugs companies that that show that providing an ssri something that increases serotonin um reduces symptoms of anxiety or depression and they're therefore they're saying that that this um this means that people with depression, anxiety have low serotonin. But I mean, the, the kind of the latest research on that actually indicates that the SSRIs do increase serotonin. But what they're doing is um, the increase in serotonin, again, goes into the cell, goes into the nucleus and actually goes into that BDNF gene, um, promoter gene and starts increasing um, brain derived neurotrophic factor production and that actually increases the health of those serotonergic pathways so it's not that you have low serotonin high serotonin it's just that your pathways might not be working properly because potentially they've been damaged by some sort of um very traumatic activity some sort of traumatic event by not having your needs met well not even necessarily a traumatic event but just not having your needs met well enough and providing safety providing a secure environment and um, can also support with in, in improving that BDNF transmission. I mean, BDNF, I think, is a really, really important one. If, if, if there's any kind of um, thing that anyone looks up after today, I'd say check out BDNF and what's going mm. on with that, because it's it's a really, really important um, uh, neurotrophin in the sense that it is so important for cell and um, synaptic health and, and, and actually just getting our brain to work properly and caring for our brain. It's kind of uh, one of those big brain care chemicals in the sense that it, it helps promote the health of our synapses. So that's one of the big things that you're targeting with, with, with safety, in my opinion. And this is huge, right? Because just because we can end up being persuaded, coerced, supported i don't know to physically do something different doesn't mean that our internalized mechanics our system is functioning any better and um uh when we think about some of the uh the, you know candace per i love candace but I, I know her books are a little bit old now and on the neurobiology side of things um candace per is the lady who found the opioid receptors that was her thing but her book um uh, molecules of emotion it's really powerful for me because she really puts across this notion that when things are working well those all the chemicals all the kind of neurobiology side of things is free flowing and it does its thing and we have our ups we have our downs 
when we start to block those because that process isn't allowed to kind of perform, we start to have problems that affect all the cells in our body. And this kind of starts to bring us into polyvagal theory now as well, Daniel, and all these other kind of things we might think about. And I think it's really important and trauma blocks systems. It just does. And, and, and it's, uh, you know, you might kind of unblock something somewhere, but it doesn't mean that everything else is definitely necessarily having a chance to catch up with that. And that's why it can take a long time. And sometimes we, we never get to, you know, that dog pre that event or that human pre that event, because it's a different person and it's a different reality and it's a different truth, if you like, that we have to kind of support. And even sometimes that notion of safety changes quite fundamentally. Um, I can't believe the, the hour's gone by really quick, Daniel. I think we've covered it quite a bit, though. And, and many people's brains are probably ready to explode on this stuff. One thing I wanted to ask you, is there any evidence about uh, how more affecting a traumatic experience might be, in other words, how, how, tra how more traumatic it might be when a nervous system is already in a dysregulated state? And I, and I only ask that because I think about my late mother. So my father had just passed away. That's a hugely challenging time for my mother. Uh, and then uh, she, there's a pub near us that she used to go to with my father and then she started going on her own. Uh, and she got picked on by some lads coming home from the pub night. So they didn't do anything physically, but it really upset her. And it was deeply traumatic for her to the point that she didn't want to leave the house period. So it wasn't just like, I don't feel safe going to the pub or I don't want to go out after dark. It was, I can't go out at all. And I wonder if that, because already she was in a particularly vulnerable state, I, I don't know whether there's anything. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would, I would suspect so. I, I think, you know, having, being in that vulnerable state does definitely increase someone's, someone's risk of um, becoming traumatized after an event. Um, so I think that, that kind of the effect of multiple traumas, I mean, it's, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I don't think it's something that as well has been researched in animals, but um, so, for example, with humans, it's it's quite well known as what's called a dose dependent effect with trauma. Um, so, if 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 you have one traumatic experience, your likelihood of experiencing post traumatic stress is is increased. But if you have two, then it's increased even more. If you have three, then it's increased even more. And also, the quality of those experiences impacts things. So, you know, the sort of lower lower level traumas whatever those might be mm. again, depends on depends on the individual um it is less likely to affect someone um as much as kind of what might be described as higher level traumas again that's a very very arbitrary term but um i think that that's what they were sort of classified as in in this sort of in this sort of research um and then i think talking about also being in that kind of state of chronic stress specifically as a traumatic incident takes place then then it it definitely increases increases the chance because it just comes down to to the factors as soon as you've got the traumatic stress physiology so you've got glucocorticoids mm. flooding through your system um your amygdala becomes more ready to fire then that's that that fear center in the brain it becomes more ready to activate and then kind of set off the both those axes again and then set that kind of whole system off so you, you do become more vulnerable and that's again that's something to think about in dogs i think we talk about that a lot with that kind of effect of trigger stacking don't we mm. um um, so yeah, definitely something to think about with, with, with dogs as well. And even general outlook, I guess, when we think about um, <clears throat> when we think about emotional resilience, and that's what we all kind of want to work towards, and especially with our dogs, and try and support that, so we can better deal with those ebbs and flows. Uh, I guess there's a relation here to what might be classed as more of an optimistic outlook, or compared to a pessimistic out uh, outlook. And I guess if you are already experiencing you know multiple kind of dysregulated or, or multiple stress events without much going on just because you're more pessimistic in mind when a real event comes along you're already in that kind of really susceptible state and i think that I, i'm sure this is something that's been looked at but again these things are so hard to study daniel because i remember there was a study that i remember being referenced when i was at uni where they, they did a kind of an optimistic, pessimistic scale, and then they followed these people over six years, then looked at the events that came along and whether they were deemed to be more traumatized by things. But the trouble is, how can you really judge that? You can look at it roughly, but um, you know, 
because the events weren't the same, they weren't all on that same train, they weren't all on that whatever it was. It, these things are very difficult. Yeah. And I think that's I, been the main theme for today, isn't it? I think just yeah. uh, that we have to, as professionals, try and equip ourselves with as much understanding of the um, the kind of objective science and then allow ourselves to be brave enough to allow the subjective anecdotal in the moment because that dog will have a unique story for us yeah yeah i mean i think one thing that might be that, that is quite useful in that sort of that 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 way that that pos positive pessimistic bias to look at as well is thinking about the attentional um the mm. attentional effects on dogs of trauma because dogs and people that have experienced traumatic events often have issues and it can be very very hard for some dogs to and, and people will certainly see it with dogs but people is more of a research phenomena and rats is also more a research phenomena in this to actually disengage with um things that they are fearful of so actually intentional inhibition disengaging from whatever it is that you've seen that you might be fearful of is much harder if you've experienced trauma than mm. if you haven't and they also have and this is again an attentional bias in in many cases to look for um potential potential fear related stimuli so again if you've experienced trauma you're more likely to notice that fear related stimuli even if it's not even related to your trauma you're more likely to notice something that might be vaguely fear related than if you mm. haven't experienced a traumatic event Wow, Daniel, amazing. And I think, uh, as always with these conversations, the big theme for me on, doesn't matter who I talk to, is stay humble, guys. We, we all have to stay humble and that we know a little bit about this, a little bit about that. And even people who specialise in a field like Dr. Robert Faulkner-Taylor, who is a, is a giant, I think, in behavioural science, uh, says often that uh, we don't, you know, we know a bit, but, we, but there's way more we don't know. And I think we have to stay humble in this, in this regard and just keep turning up to try and be available to those truths of others whether that's another human or, or dog uh, i think that's amazing so daniel where can people find out well make sure we share your links in that in the group i know um it's animal behavior kent isn't it is your kind of um your pr private practice yes yes it's animal behavior kent um if you want to learn more about what i do um, and, and kind of the um, education side of things that I provide, you can go to ABK Learn. Um, if you type it into Google, you should be able to find it. If not, um, I'll, I'll send you the link as well to, to pop in the comments. Um, the other thing we're doing soon is we've got a Neuroscience of Frustration in Dogs webinar coming up. And um, that's coming up on the 30th of November. So that's quite soon, actually. So that'd be a really interesting one. If anyone's interested in kind of frustration side of things and, and what might be going on there from a neuroscience perspective um yeah a really tricky one actually because <laughs> finding solutions for frustrated dogs is, is a challenge and even the definition of that and what that looks like and what it is that is actually not what need isn't being met in that can be quite difficult so yeah. i'm going to put you on pre-approved posts in the group daniel so please share anything you have educational content wise uh because i know uh you know you have a really accessible way of, of kind of communicating these things and that's a gift in itself really and, and it's been an amazing hour we had some amazing comments in the group daniel so if you have a chance have a look um thank you everybody uh for this evening um uh our next one that's lined up i've got a couple that are kind of waiting to confirm but the next one that's in the diary is december the 16th and that's with the wonderful linda michaels um we're going to look at her journey through the hierarchy of dog needs into do no harm uh that's gonna be really fascinating and a bit of a coup for the group because linda doesn't do many doesn't do many uh -huh. interviews well thanks everybody that's been amazing thank you so much daniel it's been great Exciting. No, brilliant. Um, thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you. And yeah, as as, as you say, you know, so much to learn. <laughs> so much so for us all to learn. It's a, it's a big field. <clears throat> and that's what's so wonderful about this, right? You know, I think we just think, you know, uh, and it can be overwhelming, guys, and, and we can feel that. But we just have to take a breath and think, OK, whatever I know, I can do something with, you know, and we can connect. Uh, okay, well, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. G uh, good night, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube, hit subscribe, uh, because then you'll get a notification on all the, all the kind of chats as they come up. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.